Welcome to the bonfire, Unkindled One. Hey everyone, it's Blue Liz Jello, and welcome back to Everything Possible in Dark Souls 3. Last time, we took a stroll down the Road of Sacrifices, we had some fun with Egon as a summon, we also fought the Holy Knight Hodrick yet again as a Mad Phantom Invader, and we took out the Crystal Sage. Next, we're going to be heading to the Cathedral of the Deep, but before we do that, we have a few preparations and a couple things I want to get done in Firelink Shrine before we move on. First oh, things first, I'm going to talk to the Shrine Handmaid, one. sell some of my souls, and then pick up a few items for the Road Ahead. I just love how fast it is to use these consumables now. And next, just so I have these on me, I'm going to buy three more Charcoal Pine Resins, and I'm also going to finally buy the Tower Key. Keep in mind, these 20,000 souls could be spent on leveling your character, so only do this if you are convinced that this is the right road for you. If you want to invest in more levels, I don't blame you. And lastly, I'm going to buy a dagger. This is going to serve two functions. For today, it's going to serve just one function, and I'll talk more about what that is in just a moment Ashen here. One. Be sure to bring more souls. With our newly acquired dagger, we're going to go talk to Andre. Ah, well met. Tis good to see ye in good health. What needs smithing this day? And while I have no intention whatsoever of actually upgrading my dagger, I am going to infuse it. And I'm specifically going to infuse it with a fire gem. The reason is a lot of the enemies in the upcoming area are not only weak to fire, but they actually get staggered very easily. So having this in the offhand can actually be very, very beneficial. The other function hey, we won't be, be using until we go back to the Farron Keep. To see my work squandered. <laughs> With that taken care of, now let's go talk to Grey Rat. We're going to actually buy oh, some man. items from him that are now available since he pillaged the Undead Settlement so we can trade them in with the Crows. First, we'll purchase a Divine Blessing. As you can see, this fully restores your HP and cures any ailment, and you can only buy one from him for now, but we can get more later on. And then we're going to buy a single Lightning Urn. Again, he only sells six. We can get some further down the line throughout the game, but we just want to use Goodbye. this for trading purposes. And now I'm actually going to stop by the Shrine Handmaid because I meant to show this off at the end of the last episode. But now that we've actually gone through the Road of Sacrifices, there are some new armor pieces we can pick up, including the entire Exile armor set. This armor becomes available once you kill the two Exile NPCs just outside of Farron Keep. Iron Mask of the Watchdogs of Farron's Keep within the wood, an emaciated old wolf commands Watchdogs to defend the sanctity of sleeping warriors. And then the Sage's Big Cat, which becomes available once you've killed the Crystal Sage, Enormous hat that completely obscures the face belonged to twin gurus known as the Crystal Sages. The pair are said to be successors of the great Ashen sage Logan, and his big hat is a sure? symbol of their pedigree. Now, if you played Dark Souls 1, you probably noticed that the crystal magic that the sage was actually casting at us is very reminiscent to that of Big Hat Logan, as well as Seat the Scalas in the Duke's archives. Now that we have the tower key in our possession, we are finally going to head up into the tower at Firelink Shrine because there are a few key pieces of loot that I want to pick up, but we're also going to be stopping by the crows so we can trade in everything that we have available now. Also, considering there's a loading screen, I figure why not change my loadout since we'll be doing that momentarily anyway. No seed of a giant tree just yet, but we can unlock this tower. And the other nice thing is once we get up to the crows, we can finally kick that ladder down so we don't always have to run up this tower and we don't have to make that clumsy jump from the tree. Not too worried about taking any fall damage here, so no need to cast spook. Just carefully walk down here before we go forward. There we go, little fall damage, never hurt anyone. Unless you were extremely low on health at that point already. You, you. So the first pickle pea item that we'll be giving them is a divine blessing. Pickle pea, pickle pea, pickle and we get our first wood carving, the very good carving. I'll go ahead and let you listen to this one. Anyone familiar with Dark Souls 1 knows that these were carved by Hawkeye Goth, who we met in the DLC. Very Next, the Sigbroi that Sigward had given to us after we killed that fire demon. This will be a pumper rum item. Pumper rum, pumper rum. And this time we are rewarded with the Armor of the Sun. Now we've already picked up the iron bracelets, but now we have one more piece of Solaire's armor. 
Now personally, I find this chess piece to be one of the goofiest looking in this game, but you can't help but feel just a little bit of nostalgia when you put it on. And now, we will go ahead and take that newly acquired lightning urn, and drop that as another piece of pumperum. And continuing on with the Solaire set, we get his Iron Helm. I actually really enjoy the way that Solaire's helm looks. I'm a big fan of the bucket look. And we'll throw on the Iron Bracelets just for fun. And next, let's drop an Alluring Skull, another piece of Pumperum. And we get our next carving, the Hello Carving. Really fun to mess with invaders when you're actually using the chameleon spell and then you throw a hello carving. And the vertebra shackle, a piece of pickle pea. This will give us none other than the mask of our dear friend Lucatiel. We already picked up her entire armor set in the Undead Settlement and now we can complete it with this lovely pointed feathered hat as well as the very scary old man mask. Perfect. Next, we can drop a Shriving Stone that we picked up on the Road of Sacrifices. And this is for the I'm Sorry wood carving. And then just one more item to drop off, and this is the Cleric Sacred Chime. Keep in mind, any Sacred Chime will work. It just so happened that for now, I'm done using the Cleric Sacred Chime. And for that, we get the Help Me Carving. So those are currently all the items that we have available for trade. In fact, that is most of the items you can trade in the game. Some of them we won't be getting until much, much later, but we will be trading those in as we get them. But now that that is done, let's head back up the tower and actually go get the loot that these 20,000 souls have bought for us. Instead of dropping down, we will run straight across. And over on this side, we do have an elevator. We're going to be heading up even more. Climb another short staircase. And at the very top of this tower, you may have already seen it, but we have the Bell of Awakening. This is the bell that presumably was rung in order to wake us up out of our slumber. Was this the same bell that tolled in order to wake the Lords of Cinders? I'm not sure. Probably. Although it seems strange that the bell would do two different things. It would wake the Lords of Cinder and the Unkindled Ash. Here I am using the binoculars to look at this corpse because we're going to be seeing a lot more corpses in just a minute or so, but this is actually the corpse of a deceased Firekeeper. And this is a very specific Firekeeper because as you can see, we pick up her Firekeeper Soul. Now this Firekeeper Soul is not like the ones we've picked up previously in other games. This one says that it's the soul of a Firekeeper who is said to have returned from the Abyss, and we'll talk about more what this can do in just a moment, but who did this belong to? We know that all Firekeepers are female, and we only know two females that have been able to traverse the Abyss and have survived. Dusk of Ulysseel, who traversed the Abyss because Manus actually grabbed her and pulled her into the Abyss, and the witch Beatrice, who did so also in Dark Souls 1 because she was able to help us fight the Four Kings in the Abyss. So did this belong to Dusk or Beatrice? We know nothing about either of them becoming a Firekeeper, but I don't know of any other females that have ever made that trek in the Abyss. I don't know. Let me know in the comments below who you think it might be, or if it's just someone we've never heard of. We can see a couple of shinies that we want to get. So here I am lining up this shot. And we're going to get ready and then sprint and jump. And unfortunately we're going to continue falling and that is an automatic death. Even if you use the spook spell, if you don't hit that landing the first time, there is no surviving, unfortunately. So this time, I'm going to line up just a little differently. This time, I'm going to center myself on these stones, and instead of jumping, I'm actually going to just run. This is the first time I've actually tried this tactic, and it worked. 
and we can get the Firekeeper armor set. The robe, the gloves, and the skirt. And now I'll cast Spook so I can drop down safely without healing. But if you notice, all around us, there are actually corpses of deceased Firekeepers. So as a Firekeeper has served its purpose and its life is coming to an end, they are dumped here in this pit just below the Bell of Awakening. It's a bit depressing, but I also heard a theory, and it's one I really like. The blood on the Firekeeper's hands very well could be the blood of the previous Firekeeper. Maybe, as the new Firekeeper is actually coming into power, they are responsible for dumping the old body. Very well could be. But the last bit of loot that we get is the Estus Ring. The Estus Ring, when you equip it, it will give you 20% more healing capabilities from your Estus Flask, as long as you have that ring equipped. Now keep in mind this does not impact your Ashen Estus Flask, only your regular Estus Flask. There is an Ashen Estus Ring, but that doesn't get picked up until much, much later. But now that we have that Soul of a Firekeeper, let's go and talk to our current Firekeeper to see what we can do with it. Where is she hiding? Is she still sitting on the stairs? Of course she is. She's apparently had a long day. Welcome home, Ashen One. Speak thine heart's desire. Ashen One, this is much like what lies within me. Then let it find its own place within my bosom. She will understand. We are both fire keepers after all. The fire keeper is now able to heal the dark sigil. So the dark sigils that we accumulated from Yol as he drew out her true strength okay, can now sister. be healed. And along with that, the curse May of hollowing would also be healed away. as well. Now, it can be very expensive because the way that it calculates how many souls it takes, it would currently look at your level and say how many souls would it require in order to get those five levels that we got from Yol and get them through the Firekeeper. In our case, over 33,000 souls. Also, if you do this, Yuria's quest line will be canceled and there's no way to restart it in your current game cycle. Something to keep in mind. I have just enough souls to get one more level. So we're not actually going to put it into Vigor. This time, we're actually going to start focusing on our strength and dexterity so we can start using more weapons as well as trying out some other infusions. There we go. And now you can completely forget about this next part where I just run around in the wrong direction because I thought I had to go get some more souls to do what I want to do next, and then I remembered I'm level 31, not 32, so I can completely just erase that from existence. But now what I want to do is we're going to head to the Undead Settlement because I want to reverse our hollowing. Even though you might not have gotten a really good look at us in a while, we are looking very, very dry and decayed. And that is just not the look that I'm going for. By the way, speaking of looks, these fashion souls are not our fashion souls. Don't worry about it even for a moment. I'm going to be fixing that before we actually get underway. Killing just a few rats because we are heading to the statue of Velka. If you remember, I said there are two ways in order to reverse your hollowing. You can buy a purging stone from Yuria for 4,500 souls, or you can pray to the statue of Velka and you can request dissolution, which will cure your hollowing for only 100 souls per level. Looking not too beautiful. So because I'm only level 31, it costs 3,100 souls instead of 4,500, so we just saved ourselves 1,400 souls. Now, keep in mind, as long as we have Dark Sigils, we will continue to accumulate the Curse of Hollowing every time we die. But for now, underneath the level, you can see that the Hollowing has now disappeared. Perfect. Well, that is all the prep work that I wanted to get done. So let us head back to the bonfire so we can finally go back to the bonfire of the Crystal Sage, and then we can push on to the Cathedral of the Deep. And I'm going to incorporate a little bit of editing magic because as you see when I wake up at the Crystal Sage Bonfire, 
I will no longer be looking like a mismatched Solaire. I'll be wearing our current fashion souls. Here we are. So let's actually get a look at the gear, and I'm going to give you one more view of my stats just in case you missed it previously. Oh, and I should probably Ember since I died in the Firelink Tower. Whoops. We're using the Raw Astora Sword Plus 4, the Fire Infused Dagger, of course the Grass Crest Shield, the Sorcerer's Staff, the Longbow, as far as Fashion Souls, this is the Cell Sword Helm, Fire Keeper Robe, Cleric Gloves, and the Cleric Trousers. For rings, although I'm switching this up, I have the Life Ring, the Covetous Silver Serpent Ring, which will switch out for the Estus Ring, only for me to put the Silver Serpent Ring back on, the Chlorinthy Ring, and switching out the Blood Bite Ring because there's not too many things that are going to actually cause us to bleed, well, nothing that we can't control at least. And then of course I look at my Hotbar items, and my stats, and again, as always, if you want to get a better look, go ahead and pause the video now. Also, as you can see, I still have Spook and Magic Weapon equipped, both of which are going to come in very handy. So now we have this path off to the left from the Crystal Sage Bonfire, and as we climb this hill, we're gonna hear the familiar twinkling of a Crystal Lizard. Well, actually two. One plunge attack later, and we get a Twinkling Titanite. And then we can just see where the other one is, so we know exactly where to head. Easily dispatch him for another Twinkling Titanite. This is probably going to be the episode known as the Twinkling Titanite episode. We get quite a few. And then you can see we have an Evangelist and some of those giant undeads with the cages on their back, but we're gonna handle them from another angle. One that'll offer us a little bit more damage right off the bat. Because as you can see, up on this ledge, this giant undead will be walking directly underneath us, which gives us a great opportunity for a massive drop attack. With him dead, we can hear another one coming. Roll out of the way of his charge attack. I find it easiest always just to get those two hits in and then roll straight back and you should avoid his attack. And now he is dead as well. And just look at that cage, just full of wrapped bodies. Ugh. Now to deal with the Evangelist. If you cast Spook, you can avoid any fall damage, but you can also, and even more importantly, get up directly behind her for a backstab. And I'm also going to cast Magic Weapon for that extra added damage. I just said extra added. Probably one of those wasn't needed, but you get the idea. My favorite combination is the backstab followed up by a charge R2. Does so much damage so quickly. So much damage so quickly. And then we get the Herald armor set. Nothing too much to say about this other than if you started as a Herald, you already have this. I haven't found too many uses for this armor set in Fashion Souls, but if you have any builds that currently use this and you just think it looks great, let me know or even send me an imager link. I'd love to see it. Get our next bonfire, and then before we head up the stairs, we can see to the right, just down here, we have a shiny, a very important shiny, mind you, and we have this human enemy to deal with. And while this tactic has worked a number of times for me, you're going to see it fail, and fail very, very drastically. And instead of the plunging attack, I actually slid down that hill which gave this thief enemy a chance to really start doing a number on me. And you can see my bleed meter starting to build up. Sometimes I try to anticipate his attack. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. You can see that hitbox detection at work there because as I did my lunging R2 attack, that dagger actually went right over my head. The precision on some of those is just impressive. But he was guarding the Paladin's Ashes. These ashes are very heavily related to All Father Lloyd, who we heard about a lot more back in Dark Souls 1. But giving these to the Shrine Handmaid will unlock the Undead Hunter Charm, Dual Charms, Morning Stars, Crescent Axe, 
canvas talisman, and the Lloyd Shield ring. We'll take a closer look at those later when we actually hand the ashes in. Up here, even though there's a good bit to explore, the only piece of loot on the left is the single Titanite shard. So once you grab this, just head back to the main path. And heading back to the main staircase, we're going to climb up just a little ways. We can see another human enemy up there, some sort of brigand. And then we're going to crest around just this small hill and then drop down and we're actually going to take this path up and around and it'll put us just above him and we'll also get a piece of loot for it. Now we picked up this grass crest shield in the Road of Sacrifices and now we get the regular crest shield. Any shield that is known as a crest shield has a very specific purpose. We know that the grass crest shield gives us stamina regeneration. This crest shield gives us very high dark damage absorption. You can see 86% of any dark damage coming our way is going to be completely absorbed by the crest shield. There are only a few times that you may want to use this, but it is very valuable during those times. But now that we're above him, if we're clever and we're careful, we can actually get a very powerful drop attack on him. So I'll use Magic Weapon for the extra damage, Spook so I don't take any fall damage, and now, hope for the best. He almost backstepped out of the way, but we got it. And then as soon as we get him in our clutches, it is over. He didn't even get a chance to use it, but he did just drop for us the Spider Shield. This was one of my favorite shields in all of Dark Souls 1 because it was immensely useful in Blighttown, and we are going to get some uses out of it in this series as well. While you can see that it's taken a massive hit in the physical absorption category, it only now blocks 80%, it will block any poison or toxic effect that weapons or projectiles would normally inflict upon you. In one of the upcoming areas, that's going to be very, very valuable. It also allows you to use your weapon skill instead of parry, and that's something we're also going to use once we get to Farron Keep, and that's another reason why we picked up the dagger. Now this next section, even though it's short, it is full of dogs and crossbow hollows. Two enemies that when combined can really make travels difficult, so I like to take out this dog first from range. So we're going to slowly move forward and just pull dogs one at a time, and now you're going to see why I have this fire dagger. One hit, even though it didn't do much damage, will cause them to writhe in agony on the floor, allowing you to switch to your main weapon and dispatch of them very quickly. Giving you a bit of the lay of the land, you can see all these fire bolt, fire and crossbow hollows, dogs up ahead, dogs up on the ledge. What I like to do, instead of taking this high road, is actually go over to this lower path where you can use the trees and the rocks as cover. You can see that dog there, and we're going to get his attention just by running past. So we're going to use the same tactic, switch to the fire dagger, get him on the ground, and then finish. If we just run up and take care of this hollow, no big deal. Then we can backtrack because we have the dog's attention. And then rinse and repeat. As you know, these dogs can be some of the most difficult to deal with because once they hit you, they tend to hit you over and over again. So if you can actually get them stopped dead in their tracks, it just makes it that much easier. Fire arrows, as you can see, have the same effect. And at this point, I shouldn't have kept firing the fire arrows. I should have just used the large arrows like you just saw because they do more damage, but hey, I'm not perfect. And then the only piece of loot in this entire area to get is this large soul of an unknown traveler, but it is worth a thousand souls, so it's worth picking up. And now I keep talking about the Cathedral of the Deep, we finally are going to actually see it in all of its glory. Well, at least part of it. But we have a new enemy type. It is just a hollow, but they are brandishing this fire weapon, and they'd love to just set themselves on fire and then charge at you, doing 1100 damage in the process. 
if you happen to get caught in it. I do like to actually use those to help kill other enemies though. That's a lot of fun. You can see an item up there in a window. We'll be getting that in just a moment here, but through these double doors, this is where we already get another bonfire. This is one of the areas in the game that just makes you question the bonfire placement because they are so frequent. We had the Crystal Sage, the one just before the cathedral, and now in the cathedral itself. Inside, we get the Notched Whip. Just like any other whip in the game, you cannot get repasts, you cannot get backstabs, but this one, unlike the normal whip, actually does have bleed buildup, which can be really interesting, and the skill is the same. It's impact, which means that you'll use this to actually evade an enemy's shield, and you will slow their stamina regeneration for just a little while. On either side of the bonfire, we have these large double doors, and as you could probably already guess, they don't open from this side. There are a lot of doors in Dark Souls 3 that for some reason are one way only. Maybe they should have push and pull signs on them, maybe that would help. And I'm resting just to get back any Estus Flask or health that I might have lost along the way, and because the only enemy that's going to respawn that might be an issue is that Immolation Hollow straight ahead, but he's not even paying attention. Dealing with that hollow because we want to get a good look at this well because we'll be coming back for a very important NPC encounter in the next episode. Taking care of these hollows because they will get up once we actually go for that item. But they're not too difficult. And they were surrounding an Estus Shard. I will always take another Estus Flask. And now we have a decision to make. We can go up to the graveyard or we can drop down into the little creek that actually surrounds the cathedral, and that's where we'll be heading. And now, other than those free souls, we are going to see exactly why this fire dagger can be so useful. But keep in mind, anything fire related, fire bomb, fire arrow, any pyromancy will have the same effect on these creatures. But I want to actually block a hit from this enemy so you can see exactly what happens when you get hit, whether or not you're blocking. Now that we're hit, let me go ahead and hit him with the fire dagger. Watch him writhe around and take him out very easily. And now let's take a look at my character because you can see our bleed meter still building. And that's because we are now covered in leeches. And this is one of my favorite mechanics in all of Dark Souls 3. It's so simple, but I think it's so clever because it's logical. All you need to do to get rid of these leeches is pull out your torch. Leeches hate fire. This is known. Well, I guess anything hates to be burned, but still, I thought that was really clever. Getting a look at the path up there, just so we can connect the dots later. We have two more of these leech mongers to deal with. I don't want to chase him down there, though. I only want to fight one at a time. So again, fire dagger, and then longsword. Easy enough. And over on this corpse, we get... The Saint Tree Belvine. The Saint Tree Belvine is a sacred chime, so if you really want to, you could trade this one to the crows. But like other sacred chimes, it also has the gentle prayer skill, one that you know I'm very fond of. It does take 18 faith, so we can't use it at the moment. But this sacred chime does have a lower spell power than most of the other ones, but it is also faster at casting. Because of its speed and its low spell power, this is really good for casting any miracles that either have very low scaling with spell power, or they have no scaling at all, like the deep protection buff. Now, showing you another form of fire attack, the fire bombs. And you can see that did a lot of damage off the bat. So having some fire bombs is not a bad idea, and it's also why I brought the charcoal pine resin, just in case. With those out of the way, we can head up these stairs around the cathedral. We see a crystal lizard off in the distance, but not before grabbing a titanite shard. Now with this crystal lizard, I like to lull him into a false sense of security by missing at least three times. That will actually cause him to stop right up against that railing and allowing you to get the easy kill. Pro strat works every time. And with that Twinkling Titanite, we can see yet another Crystal Lizard. Let's 
let's take care of him for yet another Twinkling Titanite. We've already gotten four this episode alone, which is very good for upgrading some of those unique items. And over on this corpse, we get another Titanite Shard. Which is good, because we still don't have the ability to buy them yet. But once we do, we'll be trying out a lot more builds, I promise. And then we can see this cluster of crystals. And we've seen them before, back in the Cemetery of Ash. And just like there, we have another giant crystal lizard. One who has been devouring on souls, and has grown to monstrous proportions. So let's deal with him the same way. Just avoiding his attacks very easily. Now, had I been in front, I could have gotten the Visceral attack on him just now. But with that, I should be able to finish. And we get a Titanite Scale, a necessary component of upgrading those Soul Transposed items. And then inside here, currently, this is a one-way. But we're going to deal with this Leechmonger with another Firebomb. And then rush up and finish with a Longsword. Over here, this shiny, we get the Poison Bite Ring, which is going to be very useful in the area to come, the Farron Keep. We've already seen one of these Bite Rings, the Blood Bite Ring, and this ring works the same way, this time just with Poison. Equipping this ring will increase our Poison and our Toxic Resistance by 90, giving us a lot more time in order to be in anything that would cause Poison before we actually get afflicted. Taking a look up here, I'm going to be speaking more about that area up top when we get there, but just so you know right now, you cannot survive that fall. Just take my word. Before we go up those stairs, in order to get that item that we saw in the window previously, I'm just going to head over here because again, I like to connect the dots for any of these multiple branching paths. And we can see here, there's the water down to the left where we first met those leechmongers. And inside this room, we have a ladder way up there that we're going to have to kick down in order to create a nice little shortcut. But now, completing the loop. And back up top and up this ramp. And here's the corpse in the window, and it's another Titanite shard. And from here, we can just hop down in. No need for us to go back to the bonfire. You can see exactly where it is. And we'll head outside, and now we're going to take that other path, the one that actually heads up into the graveyard. Now, just a quick note about this graveyard. If you are looking for a get rich slowly scheme in Dark Souls 3, this is the area to do it in. Because these hollows that are popping up out of the ground are infinitely spawning and can yield up to a whopping 22 souls apiece. I know. I know, be still my beating heart. Honestly though, it's not even worth your time to stop and kill these enemies as long as you have a way around them. If they are blocking the path, then it's more than acceptable to kill a few just so you can get by, but just keep moving as much as you can. But there are a couple pieces of loot in here that you might want to pick up, especially this first one we're going to get hiding behind this hollow, because he seemingly was paying his respects to his friend holding the Astora Greatsword. This is one of the greatest swords to infuse. If you are looking to play around with infusions, the Astora Greatsword is one of the best to do so. First off, the Astora Greatsword is the lightest Ultra Greatsword in the entire game. At only 8 weight units, this sword can be used by a multitude of builds, of course provided you have the strength and the dexterity to use it, but if you begin to infuse it, you would get an A scaling in strength if you use the heavy infusion, a B scaling in dexterity with a sharp infusion, a B strength B dexterity scaling if you use the refined infusion, and even some of the other ones you'll get either an A scaling or an S scaling in things like faith and intelligence. So play around with it, there are a lot of different things you can do with the Astora Greatsword. Now we're just going to follow this left path up and around some of these hollows. Now this one that I run past right here I should have killed because he is one of the few that can actually turn into a much more dangerous creature, which is half hollow, half leech dog that just pops out of its chest. It's one of the most grotesque creatures in all of Dark Souls 3 and really something I would almost expect to see in Bloodborne. But they are weak to fire. 
from here, you can probably guess what's going to happen. As soon as we go for those items, we are going to be ambushed by a number of these hollows. So I will use Spook in order to avoid any fall damage. And then I'm getting the Charcoal Pine Resin, because after we grab this Fading Soul and the Executioner's Greatsword, things just go nuts. And it is time to hack and slash our way out. And you can see a few of these are going to transform. And yes, these do cause the same leech bleed buildup as the leech mongers down in the swamp. So let's kill a few of these, hopefully not die in the process. And then I'll show you the somewhat hidden path that I take to get out of here. Okay, I think that should be enough. All right, just to kill a few more. Look at all those souls pile in, and here's the path. It's easy to miss, but if you take the main path, then it's actually going to put you running past a lot more hollows. But now that we're safe, we can take a look at the Executioner's Greatsword that we got. One of the most interesting features of the Executioner's Greatsword is the fact that it does strike damage. This is fairly unique in the swords because this will actually do bonus damage to anything that's heavily armored, like those crabs we fought previously. Now this cannot be infused, but it also has the ability to leech FP, focus points, from any enemies. For every enemy that is killed while you're wielding the Executioner's Greatsword, you will leech three focus points. And while three focus points might not seem like very much, most of the skills that you actually use with focus points only need one focus point in order to use it. So as long as you have a single focus point, you can use that skill. So using something that leeches three gives you the opportunity to use that skill one more time. Now you can see I'm getting this enemy's attention, the Warden, and then I'm gonna head down here because you can see we have another White Birch. And well, we know what happens when we're standing near a White Birch. That's right, our friendly giant from the Undead Settlement is back in action, and we can use him to take care of a lot of these enemies for us. Okay, he's not exactly killing this Warden for us. But he is taking care of that leech dog, so that works for me. Now the Warden didn't drop anything for me now, but they can drop their Warden Twin Blades, which is a really good weapon for any bleed and luck characters, and they can also drop their armor. And a moment ago we picked up a large soul of an unknown traveler, two more young white branches surrounding the tree. Let's take a look, we can see where those arrows are coming from. We can't see the tower from here, but we will be able to see it from another part of the cathedral. Another large soul of an unknown traveler. Three repair powders, which is fantastic because we've used so many up to date. Not even remotely true, we haven't used a single one and I don't know anyone who has, frankly. But then the best and most important piece of loot on this tomb the Undead Bone Shards, so we can again burn this in Firelink Shrine and get even better healing with our Estus Flask. And here I am, just having fun with these hollows. I thought it was very interesting that that arrow didn't do any damage to any of the hollows. That one did. Before we head up the stairs on the left, let's actually go and unlock a shortcut. But before we do that, we also have this item right here, the Curse Ward Great Shield. And anyone who's played Dark Souls 2 is probably looking at this shield thinking, isn't that the shield that the Pursuer uses? And I say, no, of course it's not. The shield that the Pursuer uses has those indents on the left and right. This one has it in the top and bottom, completely different. Okay, probably just a design oversight or a small change, but this is actually one of the few items that you loot instead of create that's upgraded with Titanite scales. It is considered a soul transposed item. Now this is a massive shield, 17 weight units, 34 strength in order to wield it, and this doesn't actually boost your curse resistance as you might think, it only absorbs any curse buildup from weapons or projectiles that only a few enemies in the game actually have. So let's kick that ladder down and head back up the stairs, and now we can push forward and get a little bit closer to exploring the inside of the cathedral. Very interesting statues. I've spent a lot of time looking at these and it looks like 
These hollows are being enveloped by something, maybe a giant leech, but it also has wings, so I don't really know what to make of this. I would love to hear your ideas in the comments because I'm just not sure what that's supposed to be showing me. Over here behind the crates, we have two more rustic coins, good for farming purposes. And then since those large double doors don't open from this side, head through this archway and grab a red bug pellet. And now let's get a vantage point of the area we're about to go and And now we have a crossbow hollow. And we have a spear and shield hollow. So we're gonna try to deal with him without getting hit by these bolts. Spoiler alert, I get hit by these bolts. The iframes of the guard break criticals are always a welcome addition though. Deal with him, and now, I don't know what I was thinking when I actually did this part. I kind of thought that I should deal with him, and I do end up killing him. But I go through so many options in my head as to how I should do it, and I finally realize that, wait, I have a bow, it's just not equipped. Let's stop overthinking this. But even though I know how to do it and I know how to avoid it, I still end up getting hitting by a crossbow bolt. But now, he's not gonna bother us anymore. So let's top off our health and start heading down. And I just wanted to show off this little neat feature. I've used this in the previous Soul game, so I was wondering if it would work. An enemy that is behind a structure, if you actually get the angle right, you can kill with a jumping R2. It is one of the few moves that will actually go through solid objects. Taking a look at the architecture here, but also, we are on the lookout for thralls who love to hang out on the walls and of the ceilings, and they'd love to surprise you when you least expect it. If they could just hold out and run a little further, I'd probably be caught in that blast quite a bit. We can see a thrall here. So let's actually get his attention before he gets ours. Just waiting for the thrall to drop behind me, because it is coming. And here is another opportunity to get a flamberge if you didn't pick it up in the Undead Settlement. And there's the sound of the pitter-patter. Let's go deal with this thrall before we move on to the hollows. And surprise, we have another one. But he was actually kind enough to drop the Thrall Axe, an item I hoped would drop for us in the Undead Settlement. I actually really like the Thrall Axe. It is very lightweight, it weighs just a little bit more than a dagger, it does some decent damage for its size and its speed, but it also has the Quick Step skill, which is the same skill that most daggers have. Very interesting weapon, and I encourage you to play around with it if you do pick one up. Killing these hollows that spend too much time hanging on a railing. Large zone of an unknown traveler and surprise another thrall. There are a lot of thralls. In fact, I would say that there are more thralls here than in all of the undead settlement. Which, you know, is actually interesting. Why are they here? They're from the undead settlement. We know that from actually their armor set. So why have they come to the Cathedral of the Deep unless the evangelist convinced them to? Just deftly skirting by all these crossbow bolts. And my favorite move, the guard break critical. Now from here, we could go up the stairs and we did just see a piece of loot, or we can actually use a way to get around it and avoid a rather substantial ambush. You can actually see the bottom part of the thrall's feet right there, waiting to drop on us. But right at the top of these small stairs, we can actually make this jump onto this small roof. And there are even some spikes there to prevent you from rolling off, which is very nice. Because this will allow us to get the drop on a lot of the thralls that normally would have gotten the drop on us. Just 
be in the lookout because there are a couple of thralls up here on this roof to deal with. Also, that shadow that we just saw is from an enemy far below, so that was a bit strange to see it there. And another thrall axe. I don't really need two, but okay. But here you can see we have three thralls just laying on the ground here, one of which is perfectly set up for a drop attack, and the other two still don't even know we're here. Don't worry, I'm still going to get ambushed by some thralls. One firebomb and a drop attack later. We deal with that last one. And we get three more red bug pellets in order to increase our fire absorption by 15% for 60 seconds. I think this scene is one of the creepiest in the games. It's so subtle, but I don't know. I have these three hollows that are just praying to or pleading to this evangelist. And we know that the evangelists are responsible for a lot of the torture and the death that we saw in the undead settlement. So were they pleading for their lives? Were they begging forgiveness? Were they pledging allegiance to the cathedral? I don't know. Could be any of those. Watch the fiery hug of death, get a couple of quick hits, and then back up. Also, you may have noticed that little cloud that actually broke when we were first approaching. That was actually an undead hunter charm that one of the hollows threw, and if he had hit me, I would be prevented from using my Estus Flask, so it's best not to get hit by those. But with the hollows dead and the evangelist gone, let's head over to this corpse, and just like they threw at us, we can get three undead hunter charms. And now this is the area that we saw below very early on, and it looks like, in my opinion, you can actually survive this drop straight below. But I can tell you from experience, even with the Spook Spell or the Silver Cat Ring, that is an instant death. So just don't try it. Or do. And then post in the comments that you tried it, and then I'll laugh at you in your misfortune. Because I told you not to. But now this is where I'm actually going to let the Thralls get the best of me. Because as I come in for the backstab, one Thrall gets me. So now I can get the backstab. While I try to finish him off, he's going to get me again. So I killed that Thrall. Okay, fine. Everything's safe, so we'll run in here to grab this soul item. Soul of a Nameless Soldier. And lo and behold, another one. Luckily, he was a bit slow in the draw, and I was able to take him out. But look, there's another one. Yeah, if you run in there to get that soul item, not only will the Thralls on the roof attack you if you haven't already killed them, but there are three more to handle. So definitely take these ones out and try to clear that room from a safer distance than what I did. There's another undead hunter charm that he tried to hit me with. We're also going to see another charm later in this episode, one that is arguably even more valuable, especially if you're doing PvP. And right here, I'm going to buff my weapon with magic weapon because we have another warden to deal with. In fact, we have two more, but if we can just put one at a time, it'll be a lot easier. There's one. Dropped an item for us, but I'm going to actually focus on this other one instead of getting sidetracked. They are nimble creatures. By the way, if you do happen to pick up any of their armor, take a look at the description, because it actually talks about just how rotted and gross the armor is, because these wardens were responsible for the disposal of all the bodies that have been piling up in the cathedral. And now, we can take a look at the tower in the undead settlement, and there's our giant friend who is watching over us and watching over those white birch trees as a symbol of respect for dusk. So cool. And here's another view. We can see that destroyed bridge that has the dead wyvern on it as well as the high wall of Lothric, risen high above. And now a couple of hollows that decide to emulate themselves, but you can also knock them out of that animation. Or you can just let them explode. Whatever floats your boat. Which is probably buoyancy. That seems to be the physics behind it. Up at the top of these stairs, we have this one hollow who's just taking a brief nap. We'll give him a more permanent solution. And before we go in those doors, let us head around here, which was actually completely pointless. 
but it gives us another vantage point of all of these hollows praying to another one of those statues that seems to be either enveloped by another creature or it's part of their ensemble. I don't know. I tend to think that that is a creature actually swallowing or controlling that hollow. But again, I would love to hear your theories. I got their attention with the firebombs so I can actually take them out somewhat one-on-one. -on -one. Because if you don't, right on the other side of this wall, there's a great axe wielding hollow, and he's going to do a lot of damage if you let him get the first hit. Backstab followed up by a charge R2, works every time. And we get an ember. But now for the first time, we are finally going to head inside the Cathedral of the Deep. Very ornate, very illustrious, and also quite expansive. As well as full of giants. And not the friendly Grapo wielding giants that we've come to love. No, these giants would rather we not be here. By the way, just about every area that I just looked at is a different area to explore. Fire also works very good on the inside. Here I am holding the torch up nice and high so we can get a good view. And you can see this slime is weak to fire. In fact, if you try to use a weapon, I'd probably be doing less damage than my torch is doing. But it doesn't work as effectively when you hit the wall. Now we have a bit of a devious trap right down here. As you can see, as soon as I get close to the shiny, that statue is going to dump a poison liquid that also has a lingering cloud effect. And if you didn't notice, because I very quickly backed out of it, I just got a dual charm. The dual charm works somewhat similarly to the undead hunter charm in that you throw it at your enemies in order to actually cause some sort of debuff. In this case, it does not prevent them healing, but it actually removes any buff that they have on themselves or on their weapon. So if you are in PvP and you have somebody who's using some crazy high damage buffs, hit them with a dual charm and it will cancel that buff immediately and they'll have to recast it. Two choices here, an elevator that will go down as well as a walkway that'll take us precariously close to that giant. So for now, we'll head down, which is going to offer us an immense shortcut. By the way, you might have noticed I didn't cure my poison because look at how slowly the poison actually impacts your health. It is really not a status effect that you need to be concerned with. Now we're gonna be taking some steps to avoid getting poisoned and we'll also have some poison healing items on us when we get to the Farron Keep. But by and large, it is easier to just let it go down over time than it is to stop and cure it each and every time you're poisoned. But that is actually all we're going to do currently in the Cathedral of the Deep. There's a lot more to explore, but we'll be doing that next time. For now, let's head back to Firelink Shrine so we can wrap up there. And the very first thing that we want to do is go and talk to Mr. Andre. Because we did pick up an Estes flask early on. Did what neat. Let's go ahead and reinforce our Estes flask. Pretty be careful. I don't want to see my work squandered. But we also got the Paladin's ashes. So let's take a look at the new items we can pick up. Gracious. Passing fine ash thou hast given. Let I own <laughs> We can now buy four Blooming Purple Moss Clumps, Undead Hunter Charm and Dual Charms in unlimited quantities, so we can use those Undead Hunter Charms to hunt for the Symbol of Avarice, the Morning Star, the Crescent Axe, the Canvas Talisman, but my personal favorite from the bunch is the Lloyd's Shield Ring. As you can see, this will boost your damage absorption when your HP is full, and this means that when you're at full health, you will get an extra 25% damage absorption when you're wearing this ring. 25% damage absorption can mean a lot of damage avoided. Don't forget to burn the Undead Bone Shard. And that is actually going to wrap up this episode of Everything Possible in Dark Souls 3. Hopefully you learned something today, and if you did, please leave me a comment below and let me know what you learned. And if I missed something, don't forget, you have to put that in the comments so we can all continue learning. 
Also, in the comments, don't forget to put your lore speculation ideas for the Firekeeper Soul, as well as those statues that we saw in the cathedral. But thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you next time.